I want to thank everybody for hopping on to this, people that are here now and people that are going to watch this in the future. Welcome to the Biotech and Longevity Roundtable from Fringe FM. If you guys go to fringe.fm, you can find out more about us and what we do. We've had both of these two incredible gentlemen, Aubrey de Grey and Mike Selden on the program, and we're going to dive deep into quite a few topics. Jenny, Jenny should be on the program soon. She's a venture capitalist, but is having a little bit of trouble with the links. And now I want to give everybody a chance because it's always hard to do an introduction to introduce themselves. So Aubrey, why don't you go first and tell people a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. And I want to say thanks for having me on the show. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Dr. Aubrey de Grey. I'm the Chief Science Officer of Sense Research Foundation, which is a biomedical research charity based in Mountain View, California. Um, we do research on a wide variety of different areas of rejuvenation biotechnology, which basically just means figuring out new medicines that will repair the various types of molecular and cellular damage that the body does to itself throughout life and thereby keep us healthy however long ago we were born. I'm also part-time as the Vice President of New Technology Discovery at the startup company <clears throat> called AgeX, A-G-E-X, which is um, also based in the Bay Area in Alameda, and AgeX is in very much that same business uh, with a particular focus on stem cells and how to use them to rejuvenate various aspects of the body during aging. And Mike? Yeah, my name is Mike Selden. I'm a CEO and co-founder of a company called Finless Foods, and we also use stem cells, but for a bit of a different purpose. We um, take a chunk of meat from a real fish once from each species, and then we isolate just the cells of interest, which are stem-like cells that can grow up in large quantities, and then we grow them out in large quantities and sort of give them the signal to turn into uh, the cell types that people like to eat. So what we're doing is producing non-vegetarian, non-vegan, real fish meat uh, but instead of growing it inside of a fish, we are growing it outside of a fish. Um, my background is in biochemistry and molecular biology and also in political and environmental activism, which is sort of how I ended up here. And I think that there's a lot that this can do to fit into any sort of talk on longevity um, or sustainability in general. So happy to be here. Thanks, Matt, for having me on. And thanks for coming on. And guys, my name is Matt Ward. I run Fringe.fm. It's a long form podcast where we get the world's smartest folks to talk about the biggest problems, where we're all headed and how technology converges to both change and define what it means to be human and where we're headed as a species. If you go to fringe.fm, you can learn more and subscribe to the podcast. My background is a startup guy, a serial entrepreneur, angel investor. And now I'm working with, yeah, some of the most interesting folks in the industry. We've got them here. Now let's jump into it, biotech. So the first thing I wanted to jump into right now is Biotech's moving really, really quickly. What's the limiting factor slowing down or holding back things from going even more quickly? And what areas are you guys most excited about? Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, I think that actually there's not very much holding it back right now. You know, the main things that hold any emerging industry back are aspects of skepticism, inability to join the dots, really, inability to make a case to an investor that there is a bona fide value proposition. And of course, that's why early stage research matters so much, why it's important to get things to a sufficient level of proof of concept where stuff can be done, um, and in particular where um, investors can see that stuff can be done all the way from where things already are to something, uh, you know, some kind of profit or exit or whatever. And, uh, you know, the area I'm in, which is the biology of aging, has certainly not been in that position until fairly recently. I've been working in the biology of aging for more than 20 years now, and for nearly the whole of that time, it's been quite a struggle to get money in the door. And in fact, we haven't really even tried to get investment money in. It's all been about philanthropy. We set ourselves up as a non-profit, a 501c3, so as to get enough money to do just a small amount of work that would bring things forward to a point where they could be investable. And the great news, from my point of view, is that over the past literally no more than two or three years, that, that has indeed happened. A number of investors have come out of the woodwork who have um, decided that, yes, a number of our projects are at a point where they can be invested. And so we've been able to spin projects out into startup companies. We've done that five times so far. And we'll certainly be carrying on doing that. It remains very much the case that the nonprofit is essential as the kind of engine room of all of this, because there are still some 
equally vital areas of rejuvenation technology that have not yet got to the investability point. And the great news is that most of our investors actually understand that and they also donate to us, albeit at a smaller level, um, so as to you know, get access to this information that we're developing and maybe be the lead investor, the founding investor in the next startup. Speaking of the importance of money, we've got a VC on the program now. we got Jenny Rook. She's the managing partner of Genoa VC. Thanks for coming today, Jenny. Can you tell Hi. us a little, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? And can, is your video working? It's not, unfortunately. Okay, no worries. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and then we'll, we'll jump back into the program. Sounds great. Well, let's see, I'm a scientist by training. Um, my PhD is in genetics from Yale University, but I've spent my career on the business side of, uh, of life sciences. It really became an investor to support entrepreneurs at the very earliest stages of company building who are working at that point that Dr. DeGray just described, which is when the science becomes ready to translate into products that um, can be made available to people in the marketplace. How do all three of you think about timing? Um, yeah, we all seem to be rather cautious and waiting for each other. Um, uh, the way that we do that, the way that we decide when to jump is actually by having a lot of conversations with investors about all of our projects before we choose to jump. And so we kind of jump when they say that, that they're willing to put money in. And, you know, as soon as, as, soon as a, a project is at the point where an investor, a major investor is willing to be the lead, then that's the point where we create the company. Have you started to see any themes or criteria that that are common across different projects that that kind of signal readiness for that initial private funding? Honestly, no. Um, all of our um, companies have emerged in very much their own way. So the first one was just um, uh, one of our major donors who decided that one of our projects was ready for ready for the private sector and just created a biotech company out of the blue himself and you know took our IP and gave us 10% of the company and so on. Then there was one uh, which happens to be located very close to where Matt lives um, uh, up in Syracuse, uh, which was started by someone who was an employee of ours and just you know felt entrepreneurial and was able to get um, you know, independently of us really um, some investor interest and started it that way. Uh, we've got one coming out of Yale actually um, just in the next couple of months which is a professor who we've been funding for several years. Uh, he's done some very important work that was um, published in a nice high-profile place. It's got paper in science and so on. But um, now it's ready for commercialization. And again, uh, th that's one where we've brought in investors who are already in our network and investing in other things, and they're interested in getting into this one as well. So no, it's, it's kind of a different story every time. Let's talk about the pros and cons of profit versus nonprofit research and focus on science. I want Mike to take this on. Why did you guys go the for-profit route? <clears throat> yeah, you know, this is a, a particularly interesting question for, for this industry and for our company in particular, because this originally started off uh, as a project that was going to be my PhD. I'm the only person guest on here who does not have a PhD, but this started as my PhD project. You don't have a guest, this is yours. And uh, so, I had received a, uh, I had been working with this nonprofit called New Harvest, which takes donor money and puts it towards grants for people to do um, PhD research in this subject specifically. And so I was planning on taking uh, one of their grants and using it. At, um, I was living in New York and working at Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine. And so I just found a few options in the area that I could use the grant in. I then began working more closely with the nonprofit and went to a bunch of conferences with them. And at these conferences, I met a bunch of investors and they all were saying to me, well, how do I invest in this field? How do I get in on this? And I said, well, this is a nonprofit and I'm a student. I actually have no idea. And so they all gave me their cards and were like, well, if you can think of anything or find anything, let me know. So after that trip, it was like a, a long jaunt to Europe. I came back to my place in Brooklyn and just looked at all these cards. And I was like, there's just enough money to do this. There's enough interest from people that I think this would actually make more sense as a company. And also the grants were very competitive at a new harvest and so it felt to me i can drop this grant and somebody will be doing equal or better work than i had done anyways but this money won't go towards this unless i make it go towards this and so for us it was a very like conscious switch not necessarily because the private industry is better but i felt that my skill set was much more uh, focused on bringing in money that normally wouldn't have gone to this and put it towards this because i think this technology is important enough that it should really see as much attention as it possibly can And yet, Aubrey, you come at it from the flip side. 
Well, I, well, like I say, I don't really come from any single side. I mean, my training, of course, is as a basic scientist in academia, um, and I, um, I guess, the main way in which I'm a hybrid here is that my original area of expertise was not biology at all; it was computer science. Um, so I've kind of got a different perspective from some people, but I definitely feel more at home with the scientists than I do when talking about money. And so I surround my pe myself with people who are much better at talking about money than me. And then that would be perhaps Jenny talking about money. Jenny, how did you get into the, the life sciences investing side of things? And why did you think now was a good time? Well, when I was wrapping up my PhD, I was looking for kind of the next step and had had gone and studied genetics, not because I knew I wanted a career in research, but because I was in love with the field and wanted to learn about as much of it as I could. And so there was, it was a separate question to me of, of what my role in society or uh, function in contributing would be. And I had an opportunity to join McKinsey and Company around that time, uh, which seemed like a great chance to accelerate my learning about what business was and learn. I mostly consulted to pharma and biotech companies, so I got to learn about the industry broadly. And so that was a great uh, education, but this was a, around the year 2000, and what was frustrating was watching from the sidelines as our understanding of, of genomics was just exploding. Uh, big pharma companies not being known for lighting the world on fire with be being at the edge of innovation. So I felt very sidelined from that, which seemed unfortunate having having just gotten this great education in it. So I, I left McKinsey and went and joined a, a small genomic startup in the Boston area, uh, that helped build that company for five years. And that was my path over to venture because I was a venture bat startup. And when I was looking kind of for the next startup to build, I thought rather than doing this serially, I'll only get a, a handful in my lifetime on the venture role, perhaps I'll be able to help many more companies in parallel. So that was my path. Let's talk about that. A couple of listeners brought up or brought up previously that they wanted to be involved in these fields. They wanted to be involved in biotech and the future that we all know is coming, but they're not sure the best way to do it. You can be a researcher, you can start a startup, you can be an investor. Obviously, you each are clearly biased towards the fields that and the focuses that you're in, but what would you guys say is the best way for people to get involved? I, I would say uh, keep in mind that it can be an incremental path. So each of my steps I came to by thinking where I am, where am I now, and what's the next best thing that I can do, either to gain a skill or experience or get exposure to a different part of the ecosystem or world or market. So it doesn't have to be the final step. You know, if you're a researcher in academia, you might not be able to get into a venture firm right away, even if you think that's where you want to end up. A next best, next best step might be go take a research job in a venture-backed startup as a way to kind of move over into that space and start getting exposure to uh, some of the concerns, issues, and challenges that have to do with the, the venture ecosystem, and then just keep moving from there. Yeah, I, I, would, I think, I think um, oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Um, I think also a lot of the things that scientists especially do that I don't really understand when it comes to choosing their direction is they, they obviously focus on what they're good at, but they don't necessarily focus on what other people are not good at, or, uh, or at least what other people are not doing. It always seems very curious to me that scientists, I mean, really good scientists, will so often choose the most competitive areas to work in, even though the result will be that what they do will be completely unimportant in the sense that somebody else will do it 10 minutes later if they get hit by a truck, um, you know, which is kind of weird to me. Uh, but um, I think it also applies, you know, if you're outside of science, that um, there's a, one great example, actually, in this area, which is close to Jenny's area, is that the very first longevity-focused venture fund was started about four years ago now by a complete phenomenon, a real prodigy um, named Laura Deming. It's just called the Longevity Fund, um, uh, with a tiny amount of money initially, just $4 million. She was extraordinarily successful. She's got a much bigger fund now and a huge amount of influence. But the point is, she went into that because she started out doing bench work, and she basically came to the conclusion that there were too many other people who were good at doing bench work and she could make more of a difference to the longevity crusade if she 
did what I need to. Yeah, I'm actually really glad Aubrey, Aubrey brought that up because it's basically what I was going to say. Um, you know, I think it's really important to go through a stage where you're sort of learning the skills that are important to like the field that you're interested in. But after that, trying to find something that nobody else is doing is really important because, you know, if you're just taking a job in whatever the field is, it, it's sort of, you know, you feel good. You're like, I'm doing this work, but either, you know, building a job that didn't exist and using that to forward your field or doing something new and innovative with a position that was already going to exist and bring in other things that weren't going to happen. You know, if you're really looking to push a field forward or like make a big difference, that's really what you uh, should be aiming for, I think. So Jenny, I have a question for you because you're the only one that doesn't have a, a horse in the race, so to speak. Which areas of biotech, which areas of longevity, human performance, life sciences, et cetera, are you most excited about seeing the most action in? And then which areas aren't getting enough attention but should be? And then Aubrey and Mike can react to that. Hmm. I, I think I'll use the same philosophy I was just describing for personal and professional progress, which is a bit of incrementalism. And, and recognizing, of course, that my perspective is constrained by, I, I'm, I'm looking for advances that are on the cusp of being ready to commercialize, right? And so back to your point about timing, timing is so much of the question here. So my answers will not be about what's most important or what's most exciting fundamentally, but really thinking about where I see what, <laughs> to use your metaphor, what horses are already in the race, <laughs> and then, um, and then perhaps where we're going to have to wait wait for a while for the science to catch up. I, I think that um, also building on the point that Dr. DeGray made that this has been a challenging space to to get funding for, and so in some ways watching for progress in other areas that are highly applicable or are, are basically longevity research by another name. Um, and so if you think broadly about what's happening in regenerative medicine and cell therapy and stem cell therapy, I would say what's exciting is starting to see engineered cell therapies primarily right now for cancer in the oncology space. But still, the, the set of uh, learnings, toolkit, regulatory processes, talent, et cetera, that's being developed there, I think is broadly applicable to many of the research directions that Dr. DeGray was describing that are, that are you know, of interest in the space, in longevity space broadly. So I think that's, I think that's quite exciting. Uh, as a venture investor, I don't necessarily look at what's neglected. <laughs> so I, I haven't thought, like, where are the dark spots? Um, but I would imagine it's probably those aspects that are uh, very specific to aging and probably in particular to some of the later stages of aging. Um, well, actually, so, if I could put in, that's not necessarily true, it turns out. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, the things that are neglected are often just the things that are at the earliest stage and, you know, people have not really understood why they are so important and that, of course, means that they have enormous promise from an investment perspective because they won't have much competition for a while. Um, and often the reason why there is lack of understanding is largely the fault of the scientists themselves who are not good communicators in whatever way, so there's a great deal. I, I spent a lot of my time connecting people with investors or investment people who are um, you know, good at bridging that communication gap. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would certainly find that some, some of these things are not particularly niche. They just, and they're, just, they're just very innovative, and people have ignored them for that kind of reason. Certainly when I started out, and I was not working in the investment side of things, but only in the, on the nonprofit side, um, the same thing was true, that um, there were areas where kind of everyone knew, or at least a lot of people knew, um, that such and such an approach might be valuable, but enough um, cross-disciplinary expertise had been applied to see how to get over particular obstacles. And so, you know, areas and directions had been abandoned prematurely and I was able to kind of restart them. Go into that interdisciplinary aspect, specifically, Mike, I know what you're doing is very interdisciplinary right now. How do you deal with experts from different fields to try to reinvent the way that people consume meat? 
Yeah, so you know, there's no um, like one expertise that's going to be able to build this project or anything like it. Just like you're saying, it's very interdisciplinary. We have molecular biologists, cellular biologists, protein engineers, people who work with fermentation, food scientists, tissue engineers. Having a PhD in one of these things could mean you know a little bit about one or the other, but usually you, I don't know a single person who could possibly build this field entirely on their own. And so collaboration and collaboratory environments are extremely important. Um, what we've done at Finless Foods and what we're continuing to do is we have looked at a lot of the research that is around company structure and how incredibly effective cooperative owned, uh, cooperative businesses are at creating something uh, in terms of a cooperative environment. As we try and structure ourselves as horizontally as we possibly can, um, we found that large and strict hierarchies inside of a business are not really helpful for bringing forth interdisciplinary collaboration in a good way. And we find that cooperative models where everybody gets a say or where people have like distributed authority are often better. So <clears throat> for example, um, we're hiring right now. And so what we do is a distributed authority model, which re revolves around basically passing out project leads onto certain projects. So what we've done is we've made our head of business project lead on hiring. Now, this is a person who doesn't have the scientific expertise to really vet the people who are going through the hiring process. This is a person without a science degree. But that means that their job is to collaborate most effectively with everyone else on the team who is a scientist in order to get the information necessary. And it's not that this one person is making the you know, decisions on who is hired and who is not hired, but what they're doing is deciding on the process that we go through so that everybody in their own separate fields of scientists gets a say on who gets brought through the door, how they're vetted, and then in the end, how they're selected. We found this model to be pretty effective for us. Uh, we're calling it a distributed authority model um, because it creates buy-in for everybody to make sure that everybody's opinions are heard. So, you know, in this example, our head of business really wouldn't be able to do this on their own. And since we're all working in good faith, he knows that he has to ask everybody and get everybody's opinion in one way or another. Not necessarily generate consensus because that usually slows things down. We used to do a more direct democracy model, but he has to at least take everyone's opinion into account because he literally doesn't know how to do it on his own. <clears throat> I think that's a really important thing to bring up is the fact that it's really hard to guess when you have so many people with so many expertise, how long something's going to take. And I know a lot of people here that are listening have ideas. They, that's one of the most common questions is, when will we start to see improvements in longevity? When will we start to see clean meat become price parity or price competitive? How do you guys think about forecasting in terms of over-promising, under-promising, and then some of the inherent, the inherent question that comes into how you, how you do that? Because it is it's hard enough if it's just lines of code. And when the lines of code are suddenly your body, then suddenly everything, everything goes to shit. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, as um, a former computer scientist, you know, I'm very familiar with Hofstadter's law, and it's very much um, yeah, even more true in research in, in the wet sciences. I'm, I'm, I can certainly attest to that. Um, and that, of course, is a large part of why it, there is this enormous value of death in biotech where the research just has to go on until it's done, until you get to a point where one can make sensible predictions. In my world, there is a particular additional problem, which is that people really care about aging an awful lot, and they would quite like not to have it happen to them, um, which means that there is the risk of overpromising, as you say, and whether you are under deliver or not, um, you know, uh, that there is a kind of, um, uh, you know, building up of expectations in society, which a lot of my colleagues in gerontology feel we shouldn't be doing. So a lot of my colleagues are really rather um, critical of me for going out and making predictions about time frames uh, because they feel, you know, this is, this, is, this is irresponsible. I take the opposite view. I very much feel that those of us who are experts in a given area, especially an area that really matters to the public, um, do have a responsibility to uh, go out and make predictions and it's irresponsible not to. Of course, the caveat is that the predictions have to be qualified very, very strongly. So when I give a prediction about how long I think such and such a you know, threshold level of progress is going to occur, I always take a great deal of care to say that is my prediction of how long we have, a, how soon we have a 50-50 chance of getting there. And I always say, you know, there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for 10 times that time. Um, you know, so someone has to do all that. But again, I think one does have to make predictions, certainly in areas that have a great deal of social relevance. Because if you don't get people excited, there's no money, there's no funding, there's no public interest. It's not just about the excitement. Um, in the case of aging, it's 
really more about alleviating the oversimplistic fatalism that exists. You know, if one doesn't make predictions about this, um, you know, whatever those predictions may actually be, at least they will involve, uh, there will be a number in them. Whereas the public, in default, you know, in, 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 in the absence of that, will be thinking that aging is just this completely inevitable and, you know, natural thing that is like, you know, fixing it would be like creating perpetual motion. And if people are thinking that, then of course their enthusiasm for actually putting money into it, whether it's their own money or government money or whatever, is going to be rather limited. So, you know, one has to give people a sense of proportion on this in order to get them to the right level of, of interest. And one does not want to overpromise, of course. One does only want to say what one thinks is true, and with a better luck, one will be right. And some things will happen more slowly than that, but some things will happen more quickly. And so the overall balance will be that um, the enthusiasm is, is warranted and the enthusiasm thereby grows over time. Is it just me or is the general public completely clueless to how th fast things are going in the biotech field in general? Not longevity, not clean meat, everything. In my field, well, I mean, I do a huge amount of media. So I try, so, so insofar as the public is clueless, I, I spend a lot of my time fixing that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's only so much that the public is likely to be able to take on in terms of understanding the rate of progress of any area, whether it's biotech or anything else. Yeah, I would agree. I would say um, people aren't really quite aware of even what is driving how fast this is going at this point. I mean, I can't really speak for longevity, but on this, on, on our side, and where the synthetic biology, in terms of in synthetic biology and agriculture side. Um, you know, right now we're sort of going through a revolution which is like on par with maybe the invention of the transistor or something like that, but for synthetic biology. And so people aren't really aware that we're in that phase of things, just as I think people weren't super aware of what the transistor meant. I mean, it's a very abstract concept and most people aren't even clear. Even now, I think if you asked a bunch of people, what is the transistor? I don't think most people would be able to tell you what that is, um, present company notwithstanding, obviously. So I think synthetic biology is following a similar path where the things that really do the acceleration are kind of these like unsexy, like uh, small pieces of technology that are very hard for the general public to grasp. And so it's very hard for them to even parse when people are making estimates, what they're basing it off of. And so they just sort of have to take things at face value. And if people are, you know, making really wild estimates um, in order to get funding, you know, like people saying that this technology will be here like immediately or in the next few months or something, um, it's impossible really for the public to parse that because in order to do that, you need to have this basic knowledge of the tools that we're using. And those things are complicated and honestly, to most people, kind of boring. Can we coin a Moore's Law for biotech and synthetic biology? I'd, I'd let Aubrey in on that one. I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't think so. Um, uh, even Ray Kurzweil, who is, of course, you know, the, the, the prince of accelerating change, um, he is very clear that his approach to predicting how soon such and such a technology will reach such and such a level uh, is very much focused on things around IT. And though the same methods can be used in biotech and elsewhere, they are much less precise, much less accurate. Um, and I think, you know, that's for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, not least the fact that the um, progress of Moore's law has become self-fulfilling in the sense that it defines industry, uh, you know, aspirations, you know, what people try to build. Um, uh, the, 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 the thing in, in, in biotech that I, I would say is true, though, is that one doesn't necessarily need a Moore's law. So in longevity, we have the concept that, um, that Ray calls living long enough to live forever, and I call longevity escape velocity which is basically all about the fact that the better we get at repairing the damage of aging, the less there is that we don't yet, obviously, um, know how to repair. And therefore, it takes that much longer for the stuff we don't know how to repair to catch up to the point which is bad for us. Um, and that means we can actually slow down in terms of our rate of progress in fixing the bits that we, some of the bits that we can't yet repair. Um, and we'll still be good enough. You know, we'll still be one step ahead of the problem. Um, which is nice, you know, we don't, abs we absolutely do not need accelerating change, which is handy because I don't think we can argue that we would necessarily have accelerating change. As a follow-up to that, how do you, we deal with and how do you guys think about the difference between reactive and proactive? So 
in essence, humanity kind of pushes problems to the back burner and then tries to solve them. Shit, we have climate change. What are we going to do? Shit, we're all getting old. What are we going to do? How do we shift the way that people think about the future? That's a big part of French FM is to shift the way that people think about the future. Because if you're able to think on a longer time horizon, you're able to make more money, you're able to be healthier, you're able to be more successful and achieve more. But people don't do that and society doesn't do that. A lot of it is the, the tragedy of the commons. But how do you guys think about this and how could we change it? I think it's much worse than what you said. I think that it's not a matter of reactive versus proactive. Most people aren't even reactive. In fact, almost nobody is. So, for example, climate change, you know, um, there's technology coming, including artificial meat, of course, which I won't, I'm very pleased to have um, Mike on the show. Um, and also, of course, you know, solar energy, wind energy, and so on. All of these things are absolutely going to solve the climate change problem in due course, you know, combined with other things like carbon sequestration. But um, they're not being developed now and really exploding now because people have suddenly decided to care about climate change they're only doing so because people are getting to the point where they can make money out of them because they're going to be cheaper than the traditional approaches um so you know i think we have to get used to the fact that the public are not even reactive i think the actual effects hack in facebook shows us that as well people don't care what were you going to say mike sorry before i cut you off uh no um yeah and i think it I think one thing that can be done, I don't know if this fully solves any sort of problem in terms of proactive and reactive, but I think one thing that could maybe lend us towards a more proactive approach would be to really envision what the future would look like um, on the track that we're on now and sort of think, well, this isn't uh, excellent. We should really, really be doing much more modeling of like what will be going on in the future and what we really want the future to look like. And so at least for our industry, I think one of the most important things is um, when this first started off, we had no idea as an industry that investors would be interested in this because it's kind of a weird thing you know most food when it gets funded it'll be on the market in a matter of months and then most pharma is very easy to sort of tick boxes and decide if you're going to invest in a company or not and so we're like the technology of a pharma company but then the timeline also or sorry the technology of a pharma company producing a product like a food company but we're the timeline of a pharmacy company in terms of years not months and so people were nervous that there wasn't going to be any investment that would be willing to come into this field. I think over the past year or so, that's been proven totally wrong. I mean, there's now like over 15 companies. When we started, we were arguably the second or third company, and that was like last year. So there's clearly investment coming into this, but now we have to think like, well, what does this mean then? If all these companies succeed, it means that the food supply is going to be entirely in the hands of corporations. Like, is this what we want? And I think that one of the things we could do to think about that is to sort of create a framework by which we can begin to create open source food. And that really does mean doing research in the public sector or in, at universities and sort of open source as well. Um, even if that research has already be, been done by a company, the effort to democratize research like this is I think extremely important because food should be democratized. There should be much more in terms of being able to let the public in on a conversation about food and letting people create food. Um, this transition did happen with computers. You know, at first it was really it had to happen at a university or a company because computers were expensive, computers were slow, computers were massive. Now at this point, everybody has a laptop and coding has in a large part been democratized. Anybody can code. There are large open source frameworks that are already out there, large libraries that people can draw upon and use. I think it's important to start thinking about the idea of open source biotech as the prices drop in that and how we can democratize biotech in a similar way. Jenny, how do you think about that from an investment perspective, especially with respect to patents and IP? Because the best way to have a uh, business that makes money is to have the monopoly. It is something that is core to investing strategy in the in the biosciences. You know, so, so Genoa Ventures focuses on biology beyond healthcare, uh, and so that includes exciting applications of biotech in areas like food, industrial biochemicals, agriculture. And what, one of the privileges there of that model is borrowing from the intellectual property protection um, uh, precedents that have been laid down in, in bio-based healthcare, biotech-based healthcare, where um, having protection around a particular you know, chemical or engineered organism can help uh, help a company uh, manage the enormous amount of risk that is involved in in getting those products to to market. 
generally what we're seeing, I think, in trends in IP protection is that they're more and more specific to the solution being offered by the company. And that leaves room, I think, for uh, a good balance between protecting the company's marketed product and having more sharing, more dialogue, uh, more competition around uh, the technologies, the tools, the basic science itself. I think there's always been that that balance. The basic science is in is in the public realm, and then the um, IP protection is around the company's proprietary product. And so finding those boundaries is a a way to try to thread that needle and get both. How do we deal with the fact that to take a drug to market costs a billion dollars? And arguably, if you eat right, you sleep right, you exercise, then that's 100 times better than taking some pill that's really just fixing a symptom versus preventing the problem. Because the only way that these type of companies make money is they have to have the patents. Yet, I mean, if you're just giving people the nutrients that they need that they're deficient in, they'll be significantly better. Anyone can take that. Well, I disagree with your framing, right? So. <laughs> uh, in, in different situations, it, certainly the best of all worlds is to have um, great nutrition. No one knows what that is, so that would be a separate podcast. Um, would be to have great uh, environmental health, great um, community health, and have the therapies available for specific drugs where those, uh, for specific um, diseases where those are not enough, right? So it's not one or the other. But you can only make money on one side. So that means all of the focus only goes to the one side. That's not true. There's an enormous food market, as Mike can tell you about. You can bring great foods to market and get paid for creating that value. Yeah, you know, there's, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Jenny's totally right here. Like, there's actually a lot of room for um, creation of IP here that doesn't involve other aspects that could be more open source. Like the example that I give is like, if I had $20 million and no constraints in terms of making profit whatsoever, um, I would just build up a bank of all the different cell lines that would be necessary to create any given meat people are interested in and all the um, basically chemically defined media that could produce these uh, inexpensively. That means that companies IP could really be around the actual food products that they're creating. They can fine tune these cell lines to be higher in different nutrients or to be um, grown in different ways. They can create hybrid food products. I mean, what would it look like to have a like um, piece of salmon that uses beef cells as the muscle? I don't know. And and basically there would be all these different possibilities that be, could be created from that. So there's definitely, you know, a huge potential to have like basic research done in the public sector or open source either through you know, university, which I guess still involves IP or more in someone's, you know, biohacking space. Um, and still have tons of room for companies to create also really interesting IP that can still be invested in and create products that, you know, investors and companies are interested in building together that can be sold for profit. Um, I think it's basically, I guess what I'm saying here is that I think it could be of value to create more opportunities for some of the more basic research to happen in an open source or at a university uh, way. Okay. How do you guys think about the ethics of both access and editing? You want to be more specific on that one? I don't really know. Yeah, so I know we've seen a lot of backlash against certain types of, essentially people are worried about, oh my God, you're going to edit a baby, you're going to clone a baby, you're going to do all of these things, or you're going to edit a chicken, oh my God, it goes in the dark. There's a lot of fears around the, the prospect of genetic editing. A lot of people don't even like to take medicine. And then the fact that as some of these technologies come to market, they're going to be more expensive and only available to the, the rich. How do you think about both that? ethics of making changes and then the ethics of who has access to better this, that, the other. Um, well, I guess I can talk about it from the agriculture side. Um, I think it's a lot less risky than people think it is. It doesn't mean it's entirely without risk, but <clears throat> we already have the ability to, ble to breed plants together. And really most of the changes that you could potentially make, if not all the changes you could potentially make in the, in the plant genome that you'd be editing for whatever reason, um, wouldn't be wildly different from that. You're much more likely to create something that is going to just die and not really survive at all than you are to something that is even, you know, remotely viable and can reproduce. Um, I think it's something that really should be, you know, thought about more thoroughly than I have than I have thought about it. Um, but I think that, you know, at least in terms of um, like creating 
meat cells open source the way that we're doing it, there's not really a lot of danger um, because these cells aren't going to survive outside of culture no matter what you do to them. So it's not like there's really a contamination risk. Um, I would say, I mean, we spend so much money building a lab that is free of contaminants and that just keeps even the outside air out of our lab. You know, people see our lab and they see all these safety precautions. They think, oh, it must be really dangerous for me to go in there. And the reality is that totally safe for us to go in there. It's just really bad for the cells themselves and they're not going to survive. And so at least in terms of this build, um, I think it's totally fine to sort of open it up editing because the worst that can happen is you're just going to have cells die. Yeah. I'm in a rather unusual position with regard to the um, the ethics and uh, uh, of, on both sides of your question, Matt. Um, both the question of whether it's ethical to develop these technologies and um, the question of access to them uh, because in actuality I'm quite sure that number one there are no ethical problems whatsoever around um, the development of these things and number two the sociological questions that will come along around access will also be extremely easy to solve so my main problem is rather a different one than most biotech has namely just explaining to people why there are no problems when they think the problems they are um, you know and I have to do this a lot uh, so the, the reason, of course, why there's no ethical problem around the development of anti-aging medicine is that it's medicine. And, you know, you don't often hear very much debate about whether medicine is a good thing in general and whether keeping people healthy is better than not keeping them healthy. Um, it's just that people have this bizarre notion in their heads that there's this kind of special thing that's an exception called aging itself that is somehow separate in every way from the concept of disease and disability. And, of course, once one... Uh, uh, gets gets through the fact that that's nonsense, then it you know the game is over. Um, as regards access, you know this is the thing that people have wanted more than anything else since the beginning of civilization, and so it is completely impossible that any society will get into a position where this is actually limited in the kind of way that one might see today by you know ability to pay. You know, anti-aging medicine that doesn't work, which is what we have today, is still an absolutely enormous industry. Um, and, you know, you've seen nothing yet. How do you guys think about the anti-science movement we've had lately? Obviously, we all know that it's problematic. But how would you deal with that from people where this is a legitimate concern for them as much as ignorance may be driving it? No one knows how to answer that one. I can I can talk about it for a second. I mean, uh, you know, the anti-science movement is is large and varied, um, but I think a lot of it comes out of uh, human need, one way or another, and not being able to solve problems that are complex. And I think at least for <clears throat> for things like on the medicine side, you know, you see a lot of people branching into these um, like woo cures of like um, tinctures and uh, what's the thing where you dissolve something in water and there's like nothing left of it. Um, homeopathy. Thank you. Homeo uh, yeah, homeopathy, things like that. Um, at least in America, I think that those things in, in large part really stem out of the fact that we don't have health care um, or like, you know, we don't really have a health care system that functions. And so a lot of people can't afford, you know, real medicine, things that work, can't afford to go to the doctor. Um, and so they go online and try and find whatever solution they possibly can. And so there's a lot of I mean, I'm not the first person to come up with this idea. There's a lot of people who've been speaking about it online and how the rise or the lack of healthcare in America has totally uh, coincided with the rise of these sort of non-solutions, these homeopathic solutions, because people just don't know what else to do. And they need something to feel like they're trying to make something better and are just trying to exhaust any, you know, possibilities and things. And sometimes the system just fails us. I mean, I have had that sort of thing happen to me. I mean, I haven't had insurance for a long time. I just recently got it. But had like uh, intractable chronic health problems. And at that point I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try acupuncture. I know it doesn't work for this, but there's literally no other option for me. And I can't afford the thousand to $2,000 hospital bill to go and see a doctor even for like an hour. So it just drives people into saying like, why not? Like might as well try this thing that doesn't work. And then that lends credence to that sort of thing. I mean, acupuncture does show some, you know, there's some studies that show it's uh, effective in some ways, but not for what I was dealing with. Um, and so um, I think that there's a root problem that can be addressed here, which is that we should, like all the other developed countries, get a real uh, single payer or socialized healthcare system that can actually provide for us. And I think that would really help a lot in terms of cutting down on the 
the anti-science stuff um, in large part. It's a really interesting perspective, and yet I feel that that it resonates. You can kind of see the, some of the root causes of that. Outside of trying to fix the U.S. healthcare system, which would take another several-hour podcast, what uh, what topics are you guys most excited or worried about outside of your own fields? I'm very interested in sparkling wines, <laughs> which blends some of my scientific interests and. Uh, some of the same technologies, perhaps, that are being used in, in some of my industrial bio portfolio companies uh, with a, a perhaps a not venture backable, but nonetheless, very fun um, uh, area where there's a lot of innovation available. And I think um, uh, an opportunity for the U.S. to uh, continue making its mark on this very traditional uh, category within the the food and beverage space. So that's something I'm um, in my spare time spending time on. And wine's pretty good for living longer, I hear, as well. So that, <laughs> that can help. Aubrey? Um, yeah, I, I take a, you know, a recreational interest in most visionary technologies. Certainly, I pay as much attention as I have time to to the progress in artificial intelligence research, because that's what I used to work on before I was a biologist. Um, and of course, you know, it's hard not to be really pretty excited about what's going on in that space right now with the breakthroughs in machine learning across so many different applications. Um, uh, one thing, okay, here's just one off the wall thing that I'll mention. Um, uh, in recent um, weeks actually, not long ago at all, uh, there's been a publication of some very nice breakthroughs in predicting the weather using modern artificial intelligence machine learning techniques, uh, essentially ways to unpick the chaotic nature of the weather in a manner that allows predictions to be made a great deal earlier, like a factor of two earlier than before, which is enormous in terms of not just um, you know, forecasting regular weather, but, you know, forecasting the, the trajectory of hurricanes and so on. Um, and to, to be honest, I think there's a significant potential that in the foreseeable future, we might even be able to use such techniques to tell us how to manipulate the weather in ways that are much more powerful than anything we have today, just by, um, you know, getting things down to the point where the butterfly effect is within our reach. Um, that's also been improved just very recently by the launch of satellites that can essentially do the entire job of a very large number of, of weather balloons by determining the, the direction and velocity of the wind at every altitude uh, just by firing lasers into it, basically, and looking at the reflections. Um, it, so, so, yeah, those are the things I'm interested in right now. I would say for me, I'm interested in all sorts of technologies, but I think one of the most interesting ones because of its implications are driverless cars, which I know that sounds not super exciting, but um, I think what it will do for the idea of work is really interesting because this is one of the first times where people will be, well, one of the first times in the modern era where people be thrown out of jobs in massive numbers. And we sort of assume that, you know, when an industry is crushed, that people will be recycled and the new one will take more jobs and it will end up creating more jobs. But I think to assume that this is always what is going to happen is is hubris. I mean, there's no guarantee that there will always be enough work to have an economy that's based on the idea that one needs to work in order to live. So where does that leave us, especially in a culture like America's where we have our ideas of self-worth self -worth so tied into work and being a person who works and work is defined as something that you go to a place and you get paid to work, you know, nine to five and then you go home you know, we should start, I think, in preparation for this, redefining what is work. Uh, child rearing is work. Um, house, like doing chores around the house and keeping the house is work. Cooking for your family is work. These are things that are currently completely unpaid, um, but are things that need to be done. I think we need to start untying our identity as being so tied to the idea of work and our self-worth coming from that. Um, now, since we're going to be throwing so many people out of the job so quickly once driverless vehicles are a reality, um, and what, you know, what happens? We have this whole movement in America that is all about like, no, you need to be able to, you know, e even like the, the farthest left that America goes, you've got Bernie Sanders saying things like, um, anybody who works 40 hours a week shouldn't be starving to death. And it's like, 
okay, but what if there aren't enough 40 hour work weeks to go around? Should those people who somehow can't end up with jobs be starving to death? I think these are questions that we should be asking ourselves now before it becomes a large problem. Especially as we live yeah. longer and AI progresses. Yeah. How much, how much of AI and just the fact that we've managed to start bringing down the costs of genetic sequencing has driven the, the growth in your fields, the growth in synthetic and biotech? It's been very big across, I would say, the whole of biology, the whole of biotech. Um, you know, essentially, what, the genomics, well, as we say more generally, the omics revolution, which, uh, of course, has been going on for some time now, has simply accelerated pretty much everything. It just it has become a great deal less laborious to do all manner of different types of experiments. I think that's the real main thing. Of course, there's more to it than that. Uh, there's uh, it's enormous um, possibilities in terms of diagnosis and such like. Um, uh, that, that, that are made possible by omics, but yeah, I think I think the fact that it has been an enabling technology that, speed, that has speeded things up so much is extremely important. I want to I want to get a bold ten and twenty year prediction from each of you, something that you haven't heard someone say, something you haven't said previously. I'll let I'll let Jenny go first because she's had a hasn't talked for a little bit. <laughs> Well, you'll be disappointed in my answer, which is that um, I mean, my chosen role, I don't make the bold predictions. I look for bold entrepreneurs who are making those bold predictions and are committed to a vision to a better world in the 10 year time frame. And then I support them. So if you see any, let me know. What's the most promising one? What's the one that you think you'll have the biggest impact on society? I, I, again, I guess, you know, I'm playing a different different game uh, in that I am uh, not necessarily choosing a winner above all, but but a more incremental kind of making good approach where each one has something to contribute. So a, a lot of the work that we do at, at Genoa is not necessarily in the final solutions of whether it be a drug or an engineered food. Uh, but in the tools that that people use. So, for example, one of our companies that I'm super excited about is called Synthomics. They're here in the Bay Area, and they are making machines that make DNA. So really democratizing the ability to make DNA on site for, for companies, for researchers to just accelerate that flywheel of design, build, test in the genomic space. Mike? Yeah, Mike here. I think in 10 to 20 years, I'll make a prediction outside of my own field because you're saying, you know, something that I haven't said before. I think one of the most interesting things that will come out in the next 10 to 20 years is that it will be um, the interface between um, biology and technology. I mean, like biology and real more computer technology um, will be available to consumers. Um, you're seeing a lot of projects now that are cropping up that are actually meshing the two in a pretty extreme way. You've got um, a lot of Japanese corporations which are working on um, biological batteries. So these are things that can store energy that use cellular technology in order to do so, um, rather than using, you know, this normal lithium ion or whatever type of battery people are interested in right now. Um, there's a company right down the street from us called Koniku, and they make uh, computer chips that it use, um, I believe it's uh, neurons, so brain cells, and, and they make these neurons express olfactory sensors. So basically, these are brain cells that can smell things in the air on a computer chip. You'll see a lot more things like this, I think, in the next 10 to 20 years, um, because biology is already sort of an interesting computer-like structure in a lot of ways, and it can very much mesh with technology, and in a more thorough way than just like smart prosthesis. Um, there are ways to basically use um, biology and cellular technology in order to advance what we're doing with computers and beyond. <clears throat> yeah, um, I I'll say something I have said before, but I evidently haven't said it enough because I keep having to say it again, um, which is that the event that we really need to be focusing on right now in the field of um, developing real anti-aging medicine is not the arrival of that medicine, but rather the arrival of the widespread public anticipation of that medicine. In other words, there's going to be a time when you know progress in the laboratory, even just in mice, is sufficient that the publicly stated expert consensus on what's going to happen in the future will become a lot more positive. 
And I believe that that's likely to translate into an extremely sharp and sudden tipping point in terms of public opinion and anticipation and expectations, just because at the moment, there is a great deal of pent up fatal, you know, sort of forced fatalism, where people are trying to convince themselves by all manner of irrational means that they shouldn't get their hopes up. And eventually that will disintegrate. So the thing is that could happen awfully soon. Certainly I would say it's likely to happen within the next 10 years, simply because the amount of progress that will be needed in the laboratory in order to cause that change in the public statements of even, you know, professors that have reputations to, perfect, to, to protect and grant applications to get through peer review and so on, people will actually start saying very different things. And I believe that that is the point we should be most worried about because it's the point when all of the chaos and pandemonium arising from people's different expectations and the consequences for their spending patterns on really big ticket items like life insurance and you know uh, pensions and inheritance and so on, you know, that's when those things are going to happen, not when the technologies actually arrive, which could be at least 20 years away. 20 years away. You guys heard it here. Hopefully not first, but if it is first, then yeah, refer this to somebody else so we can get a little bit more of an insight into what's happening, especially with converging technologies. It's always becomes exponential at some point. The question is just when do you start to see that real rate of progress where people truly start to buy into it? I know, I know we've been on here for about an hour and some of you guys need to run. So my last question for each of you is, if you could leave something with people today, it can be a quote, an action statement, et cetera, what would it be and why? And then talk a little bit more about where to find yourself online. I can go first on that one. So I think um, I want to leave people with the message that um, you are being told basically by people who have a vested economic interest in you um, using your your dollars as your voice and using your dollars as your vote and basically just buying things differently is the only option that can create change towards sustainability. And I would like to say that I totally disagree with that. And really the changes that will happen are not ones that focus on individual action. They're ones that focus on collective action. And the only thing that will really solve this climate crisis that we're in right now is people working together and creating a large movement advocate for change on a legislative and governmental level. Um, even just starting with municipalities, but moving up to that into entire nation states, you are not going to buy your way and I am not going to buy my way out of climate change. And it's really important for us in developed nations to do this. Um, the top 10% of uh, the richest people on the earth, which counts pretty much everybody in the US, um, are the ones creating over 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And so it is important for us to set legislation specifically that will um, create a more sustainable future for everybody. Um, and that happened by shopping at Whole Foods specifically. Um, so you can, uh, if you want more really cheery, fun things like that, you can find me on Twitter uh, at uh, Mike Selden FF. Um, please look up uh, Finless Foods. We're creating a uh, bluefin tuna without mercury or plastic. I'm on Facebook with that. I'll take over on Twitter, which is just at Finless Foods. Um, thanks, Matt, for having me so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I would say the main call to action is simply to acquire a bit of maturity and a bit of sense of proportion about the way that the place that aging resides, the place it sits in the human condition and the human consciousness. At the moment, we are in a mode that used to make sense until like 10, 20 years ago, it was perfectly rational and logical to be irrational about aging to find whatever way you might, might work to put it out of your mind and get on with your miserably short lives and make the best of it um, because there's nothing you could do about it. We had no plan. That's not true anymore. We have a plan. The plan is being implemented and it's not being implemented as rapidly as it could be, which means that lives are being unnecessarily lost in very large numbers in the future. And therefore, uh, you know, it is time for the public to just wake up exactly what they do having woken up you know that depends of course on who you are just as we were saying earlier what you should do depends on what you're good at and what you can do and also what other people can't and that means that you know if you're a scientist get into the right areas if you happen to be very wealthy make sure you use that wealth appropriately to support this work and accelerate it and everybody needs to be doing exactly what matt's done today and getting people like me on air to educate and advocate and get um 
something you know done in terms of the quality of people thinking about all of this i would say that the real most important call to action is calling other people to action the advocacy side of things and yes we have a, a website of course sense.org um it's got a huge amounts of information written for everybody from the complete newcomer to experts on what we do and why and it's also got a nice big friendly donate button and jenny and, and i'll just leave with a somewhat idealistic note of encouragement which is you know i got into venture because i really believe in the power of small teams working hard who are committed to a vision and uh, yes venture is limited to those visions that can be brought to the marketplace where money can be made uh, but that doesn't undermine or in any way diminish the potential impact of them quite quite the opposite it can be a very efficient way to drive solutions out into the world and that's what i love to do and i would want to leave the listeners with a message that now, I have the privilege of meeting hundreds and hundreds of teams every year who are trying to harness the latest technologies in life sciences and beyond to solve problems that are going to make a difference in our lives. And so just to know that, that there are people out there, um, including the folks on this, on this uh, panel, who are using those mechanisms to try to, to make change, to, to make good in the world. And that can be, if, if that uh, feels like a path that might fit with your particular metabolism, proclivities, interests, that might be something to look at as, as the startup path. Because it, it says, yes, there are changes we need to make in the system overall, but in the meantime, perhaps there are specific solutions that we can, we can bring forward that overcome those challenges um, and make a difference. So that's why I do what I do at Genoa Ventures. You can find out more on our website, genoavc.com. Big things don't move fast. It's nonprofits and startups that are focused on innovation because they're the only ones that have few enough or small enough amounts of hurdles to be able to accomplish it. Martin uh, in the audience asked, if you, were, uh, if you were a student today, you'd already done some chemistry, what would be the best way to get into these type of fields? I think we said before, it would be to focus on joining a startup or research foundation, something where you can get the hands-on experience and then think about where you want to be to be further along. Any anything you guys want to add to that? Yeah, I would say don't don't neglect the, the large codes either. If you're a, an undergrad or grad chemist, there are you know, exceptional jobs working as part of teams mm -hmm. in existing biotech, large pharmaceutical organizations, um, industrial bio, ag bio companies. So it's, it's not just the startups that are doing really interesting work in the space. Yeah, there's so much room for room for innovation. Guys, I want to thank everybody for tuning into this. If this is your first time, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on other great roundtables like this. If you go to fringe.fm, you can find more awesome interviews with folks like Aubrey and Mike. We'll have to get Jenny on at some point as well, where we talk about really the, the cutting edge of the cutting edge and how technology is converging, changing, and the ethics of that new path for humanity. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, and thank you three for coming on and taking the time. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, thank guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Cheers.